and we have something really special planned for you this afternoon. This was planned entirely by my colleague Jose Lopez Ganem, who is right up here. <laughs> you in just a moment and this came out of our conversations where we were thinking a lot about the specialty chocolate industry is often looking for other models of what it might emulate as it grows as it matures and very frequently we turn to coffee we'll be talking about coffee tomorrow very frequently we look at other industries that are actually really very similar to cacao when in fact there are a lot of very exciting things that are happening in beer, in wine, and in spirits that we might learn from and that paint a very different picture of what this industry could look like. And so we have three rock star panelists who are joining us and who are going to share their knowledge with all of you with some ideas about how you might apply what they do to the specialty cacao and chocolate market. Okay, so Jose, please come on up and do your thing. Thank you so much. And we brought the tropical weather also from the conference. It's part of the experience. Um, and just before we start, um, and I present our excellent panel today, uh, I just want to go through some housekeeping. We are performing a tasting in a classroom that was not set up for a tasting. So there's just a few guidelines. And the first one is, I hope we all realize how lucky we are that the executive director of FCCI is our star volunteer for the next hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and also very grateful that uh, Lauren brought somebody from Rebel Rebel to help. So thank you for that. Um, there's a couple of things. You must have four now. You have a wine glass. Is that correct for everyone? Is that true? You also should have a champagne booklet. Everybody was able to pick that at the entrance. Yeah. Uh, everybody has or possess a tasting mat for two different chocolates that we pair with our beer. Everybody has one of these. Perfect. And then, as you can see, in both of these rows there are pockets, and they are not for eating oysters, even though we are in New England. Um, they are split buckets. So in the rare case you don't want to finish what you're tasting today, they are there for you to discard and for you to taste new things. Or um, even if you want to split, please feel welcome to do that. That's very professional to do it over. Um, with nothing else, uh, I just want to introduce the excellent panel that we have here today. I feel very grateful that my teachers, my mentors, and now my friends are here. First of all, Christy Dufault from the Culinary Institute of America, the Harvard of Culinary Schools. Um, <laughs> Douglas Miller for, from Cornell University, the School of Social Administration. <laughs> and also Lauren Field from the one week old Rebel Rebel, the new best wine bar here in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, so we were having the discussion about transparency and impact, so with full transparency I tell you please don't drive or text because you will have an impact. <laughs> um, and beyond saying that, what brings us together today, as Karna was saying, are four uh, points. And those four points, first of all, is to break this coffee bubble that normally we compare against when we're talking about a beverage and going beyond to see not only the side of wine but beer. The second one is to look deeply into the relationship that we don't normally realize in the customer perspective or on the customer side. Normally champagne or natural wine or craft beer feature in the same marketplaces where we can find specialty chocolate. And I have never heard somebody whose main motivation of buying champagne is because the poor farmers of the Champagne region cannot send their kids to the <laughs> So it's a different market, and we all it enhances also different techniques, hospitality, marketing, marketing, trade marketing, denomination of origin, which we will hear here tonight and also tomorrow with Dr. Lista. The third, and the third uh, thing that we want to embody it is also the perspective of flavor professionals. Here you have people that have been tasting professionally and also help other people like me that embark on a quest to know how to taste, mm -hmm. to know how to distinguish and take wine and beer as that we do. So with that regards, I would like to invite our first panelist, 
who is still afford to talk about champagne and the ones behind the just hearing my approach. Okay, thank you, Jose. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It's really great. I arrived from California uh, at 7 this morning, so I um, uh, got my raincoat, but that's all right. I welcome the rain. It's fantastic. We don't have any in California. So um, my, I am charged with talking uh, for about 10 minutes about a subject that I love very, very dearly, champagne. And uh, in fact, we will also be pouring some for you in a few minutes, but You'll have to wait uh, just a few minutes because we want to make sure that that you hear the message um, as Jose well described about um, some of these parallels in the industry of, as I hesitate to use the word luxury product, um, it, it certainly rings true with champagne. So um, my goal is just to say very briefly why, why I love champagne so much. Uh, if you'll indulge me, and explain a couple of the key characteristics of champagne and why it's so um, recognized and such an important part of the wine world and the luxury consumable market. Uh, I'll try to draw a few what I what I see as keen parallels in the in the fine cacao industry. Although, full disclosure, it's not. Uh, it's not really my area of expertise, wine is. Um, and then we thought it would be really fun to open a bottle uh, because opening wine, uh, opening uh, sparkling wine and champagne is in fact uh, a bit of a skill, but that only takes a few seconds and then we'll, we'll drink some together, we'll taste some together. So, um, you know, it's very, very easy for me to, to uh, claim that I'm a big fan of champagne. I, I, I have a background as a sommelier and I work as a, as a wine instructor now, but I've always, always loved sparkling wine and champagne and I've, I've traveled there dozens, to champagne, I'll, I'll be specific, dozens of times and I uh, really, really have endeavored to learn a lot about this particular category of wine. Um, it's, it is really, really special, and you can see, um, I just have a really simple map of France behind me, it shows you where, where Champagne is. And um, it's, it's one of the reasons that it, it really is a compelling wine. It's, it, it's, it's grown in the most northerly region of all of France, so it has some very um, clima climactic challenges, and, and I'll get to that in, in just a minute. But um, as far as some of the great characteristics of champagne, I, I think it is important to recognize this, this beautiful word, champagne. The French say champagne. It means, champ means field. It means from, from the field or from the landscape, this big rolling hills. The, the region is only about um, 60 minutes from Paris, so it's easy, very easy to get to. And it's quite distinctive because it has this incredible um, calcareous or chalky soil. It sits on this big Kimmerigian Ridge that's full of chalk and the soil is literally white. Um, it's also very, very cold there and um, the average temperature um, daily is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, and, and also it, it might interest you, those of you that, that grow cacao, that um, in Champagne it's, they have very little sunlight actually, even though this is Northern Europe, they average about four and a half hours of sunlight every day, so that's, um, <laughs> that's not so great for ripening fruit, right, or ripening grapes. And um, so despite some of these marginal characteristics, uh, it'd be, if I had more time, I'd go into some of the very compelling history of the region in terms of the humanity there, the Romans and Galois history, the multiple wars that have passed through the region, and a lot of the challenges that the Champenois people have had to face um, to arrive where they are today in, in 2018 at having sort of one of the most prestigious and well-known wine brands, Champagne, in the world. So, so those are, I think, some of the, the really compelling uh, parts about the characteristics of Champagne. For me, 
I just love it. I mean, you know, a lot, Champagne has this reputation, Champagne is for celebration, it's for weddings and graduations and the birth of children and political treaties and in my house we say Champagne is for Tuesdays. And, um, and I just love it and, and I love it, I, I know a lot of chefs who love it, I know um, a lot of of people that really love it at the table, part of it is its characteristic of being effervescent, bubbly, and um, it also maintains a very high level of acidity. That is a result of this cool climate where 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 the grapes are grown. And so, um, because it's it's such a sort of beloved celebratory wine, I think a lot of this in the wine industry, my colleagues up here included, we, we aim to get this message across that. You know, champagne is in fact special, absolutely, but please don't just limit it to special occasions. Have it, have it regularly, a, as I do. Um, one, one thing I've learned about, about champagne over my 25 years of studying it pretty seriously is, um, is that it is a product like, like many that those of us that, that you know, care about high quality food products when we endeavor to learn about them, well, how can I say this? When you get accustomed, when you learn, when you, when you essentially graduate to new levels of complexity, quality, finesse, um, length, um, it's, it's hard to go back. Right? I think it's, it's hard to go back to lesser quality. And I've, I've realized, sort of, I, I say, you know, it, through, my own, through my own love of, of my nightly consumption of champagne, I've learned that this quality, in fact, has a price, right? I'm a teacher. I can't exactly afford great champagne every single night. But, um, but it's, it's very interesting to me because I've thought quite a bit about it, and I've realized that there's some other parallels, things like, um, it, for me specifically, things like fine olive oil, um, fine of other wine categories for sure, um, fine chocolate. Now that I've been hanging out with Jose, it's become a real problem. Uh, I have to spend a lot more money on fine chocolate than I than I did even five years ago. But my point is, is we we individually we sort of um, prioritize what we find quality and it's hard because you know the more you get to know it the more you study it and the more you understand the quality that you appreciate um, it, it, it's hard to go back so we kind of prioritize prioritize that and, and and often I'm a little bit jealous of my friends that are content with I don't know lesser products or mediocre olive oil or I won't pick on Hershey's, or I don't know. I, 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 so I guess what I'm saying is we all we, we prioritize things, and um, it's, it's very individual. So that that old adage of sort of ignorance is bliss, I think, can ring true. And this this um, can be an issue with with great champagne because it is in fact very expensive. There, there's no no doubt about it. And one of the reasons that champagne is very expensive is the marginal climate where it's grown. As, I, as I've explained, and also the way it's made. So I'm not, I don't have time, and I'm not going to go into the elaborate production method of champagne. That's why we brought you the booklet, and it's a wonderful booklet. I just wanted to um, draw attention to it for a moment. It's, it's uh, written by an or the organization in Champagne called the CIVC, the Committee, the, Comité Interprofessionnel de Vin de Champagne, the CIVC, and so it's their regulating organization, and they regulate all of the high standards of champagnes, including how the vineyards are grown, minimum yields of the fruits, when they can harvest, uh, bricks levels at harvest, how they press the grapes, how they make the wine, how long they age the wines, and so it's, it's very, very um, elaborate and laborious uh, process. And it's all explained in the booklet. So that, that's why if, if you, in fact, are interested, you can read through the booklet. It's, in fact, I, I, called it, I tell my students, 
please, you don't have to go buy an expensive book. This thing has every single thing you need to know about champagne in it, literally, um, except for brands. It's not, it's not about brands. It's really about, about the region and the process. So, so um, a couple of other things I wanted to touch on, I'm keeping a close eye on the clock here, uh, is one, one other thing about the characteristic of champagne, I, I'd just like to remind everyone, maybe you've heard this before, uh, champagne is a place and it is a wine. And the Champenois, the, the, the residents of Champagne, about 20 years ago, they hired an arsenal of lawyers to go out in the world and protect their name and to not use the word champagne unless you were producing champagne from Champagne, France. So, the long story short, um, most countries agreed to comply with their ask of not using this word champagne. Um, a handful of countries did not. Sadly, we are one of them in the USA. But, but it, it's very simple. I, I, like, I remind my students all the time, please respect the vocabulary, please respect the geography. Champagne only comes from Champagne, France. That's, that is a fact. Every other sparkling wine is sparkling wine. And it's very simple, the language, right? All champagne is sparkling wine. In fact, it is. It has to be sparkling by definition. But not all sparkling wine is champagne. So I really encourage everyone to try to use that language properly. I myself love other sparkling wines. I drink a lot of sparkling wine from Italy. I drink a lot of sparkling wine from California. Lots of other categories but I work hard to make sure I use the right vocabulary. And I think in the industry it's very, very important. I hope my colleagues agree. Um, so a couple last characteristics about champagne and then, and then I'll, I'll move on to, to the tasting. Um, as far as some parallels you know, to, the, to the cacao industry, I think it's, Im it's important to know that one thing that champagne has done very, very well is uh, a real partnership between growers and producers. I'm not saying it's a honeymoon all the time. I'm just saying that there are, um, it, it's, it's been working in Champagne for nearly, for over 200 years, really, this partnership. In fact, not everyone knows that there are, um, there are about 19,000 individual Champagne growers. That means farmers, people that grow grapes that they sell to Champagne houses that make champagne. There are about 260 what are called champagne houses, the, the, the larger houses. In fact, we're going to taste one in just a minute. Uh, and, then, and then there are what are called the grower producers. So the grower producers are people that own their own grapes and make their own brands. So there's farmers, there's grower producers, and there's the large houses that buy all the grapes from the smaller growers, and farmers, and, and produce, produce the wines. It, it is important to note that the, the 260 larger, you know, medium to large houses of Champagne produce about 75% of Champagne. And they export 90% of it. So it, those, those are, are, are pretty big numbers. So if you're a Champagne lover and you're out shopping for Champagne, you can find extraordinary champagnes, like the one we'll taste in a moment from, from sort of a, this is a small to medium sized house. And then I also brought an example um, just to show you of a, of a small grower producer. And there's actually several thousands of these, but their output is much, much, much smaller. My point here is that the, these are um, three sort of separate categories that for over 200 years have been working very well together. And I, I do think that they, in my observation, share this kind of the rising tide floats all ships mentality and champagne in and of itself is such a brand. Um, of course, there's competition among the houses, but, but the, the overall brand is something that is really, really important. I already mentioned how highly regulated it is. Um, you know, this is France, this is bureaucracy, love it or hate it, um, it is what it is. And I think it is one of the characteristics of Champagne that keeps it very, um, 
that, that, that keeps it very consistent and maintains very, very high standards. So for me, it's hard to criticize the, um, the regulations of Champagne. I agree with most of them, but I see them as working in terms of the overall big picture and vision of this entire region. Um, a couple of other things very quickly. I mentioned it's highly regulated. Everything is done by hand. There's no machines allowed in the vineyards in Champagne. And um, you know, maybe that's a, a parallel with certain uh, cacao industries or, or excuse me, um, areas and farms. And I think that that's very, very um, relevant when it comes to Champagne. The, the global demand for Champagne keeps increasing. I think that's happening with chocolate also. So as this demand keeps increasing, the Champenois, the Champenois actually even expanded their boundaries just a little bit. It took about 15 years to do that. It was very bureaucratic, but it's actually a good thing, in my professional opinion. Um, and because it's in such global demand, uh, the Champenois work hard to observe global trends and what's going on. They uh, bottle more wine when significant global activities are happening. They bottle more wine when the World Cup is happening, especially if their team's playing. <laughs> they, bought, they bottle more wine for Wimbledon because apparently they love it at the tennis match. Um, they bottle more wine when there's uh, political elections going on, so it's really quite interesting. So they respond to a little bit of what's happening, happening in the world. So um, I think I'm, I'm very quickly running out of time. I'm going to move on to opening the wine. I wanted to um, just uh, open it, and then we're going to pour it. Uh, Grace and and um, and Carla and maybe a few others are going to come on and pour it for you. So Grace, will you, do you mind bringing it, me up a very cold, unopened bottle of Gose? That would be great. Thanks. We're going to try a wine called Gose, and this wine is the oldest champagne house in the Champagne. It was, thank you so much. It was founded in um, 1584, which I learned is um, 50, 52 years before Harvard University was founded, which I learned was 1636, so that's quite stunning, right? Um, this, is a, this is a champagne that's very classic. It's, it's called Brut Excellence. And it's made from the three grapes that are only permitted permitted in Champagne. And um, if, if those of you want to know, I'll just say very quickly, it's made from 45% Pinot Noir, 30% Chardonnay, and 25% Pinot Meunier. It spends three years aging on its spent yeast cells on the lees, and it, that brings a lot of complexity to, to the flavors. So um, I'll just do a quick demo of opening it, and we can start pouring. So it's important, can everyone hear me? Yes. So I'll kind of speak up. Uh, that the wine is really cold, right? These bottles have five atmospheres of pressure in them. That's more than a bus tire. So bad things happen um, <laughs> if you do not control it, right? So, um, so right, they're filled with um, these atmospheres of pressure, and you want to open them carefully and slowly. Making sure that they are cold really helps. If they're not cold enough, the gas expands and pushes out. So I usually um, open, you know, you pull off the, the, the capsule, and you can do this with a corkscrew or by hand. Pocket. And it's best to uh, <coughs> open your champagne at a 45 degree angle because that way it keeps it, um, uh, it, it helps prevent the champagne from shooting out. It has what's called a cage and you give it five or six swirls and then uh, turns I should say. And then I like to use a, a serviette or a side cloth just for extra protection. I don't want to hit the board. <laughs> and um, do you mind advancing my slide one? Yes. Yeah, slide, thank you. I use my body a little bit because I need to, and um, and then I and then you slowly ease the cork out. Some people twist the bottle. I twist the cork a little bit. Doesn't really matter. What really matters is safety and quiet. And because the more quiet you are, the less gas or bubbles you let out. So that was a little. Maybe the front row heard it, but um, so 
you try to keep it quiet, and then, of course, you can pour the bubbly. The pop is fun, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> that scares people in restaurants. So I prefer, I prefer to do the pop, like, in the locker room or at the wedding or something, but not in the restaurant. So I think we're going to come around. There's lots of cold bubbly. They're going to come around and pour it for you. And I'll just say a couple quick things. I think I have one more minute before I pass it on. I really want to respect my, my colleagues here. So they're, they're coming around. Oh, it's fantastic, the champagne. Champagne Dulce. It's called Group Excellence. Um, by the way, as, when I mentioned they were founded in 1584, they had 17 generations of the same family running this operation. And only um, about 25 years ago, in 1993, they and, and I'm telling you this because I actually think it applies to the to the conference, to the topic at, at hand that, that maybe some of you, especially in agriculture, are thinking about. Um, th this is a very successful champagne house. And when they were ready to sell, you know, 17th generation just didn't feel like running the show anymore. Um, Everybody was knocking on their door. Big conglomerates, big corporations could have sold like that. But they said, hey, this this house has been run by a family for 17 years. We're going to sell to another family. And in fact, they did. So they didn't. They had huge opportunity, and they sold to, to another family, a, a family that, in fact, runs cognac houses, but a family nonetheless. So it is, it is privately held, run by a family. And um, one last thing. Maybe you, you, another quick parallel with the, with the fine chocolate industry is most champagne producers make a range. They don't just make one wine. They usually make five or six different wines. And that, they all have to be sparkling, for sure, by definition, but it gives them the opportunity to create a range of styles. And, and to me, that's, that's always very interesting. Um, I... Uh, uh, last thing, just because it's really fun that they're coming around and we are using these fun Govino glasses. These are glass called Govino. I hope you found the thumb imprint. It works for both lefties and righties. Um, as I like to say, fun for the beach, the boat, and the bocce court. Uh, about 10 years ago, I would have shrugged at drinking such fine champagne out of a glass like this. But just like I, no, 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 that's a good point. Just like I started, even as your standards of quality increase, sometimes context is very, very, very relative and important. So as long as I'm drinking the good stuff, sure, I mean, occasionally a wonderful glass is fine, but this is positively the perfect glass to have this wine in today. In a room like this, um, in this autumnal weather and uh, the other, in fact, in line with the, the magnificent products we'll be tasting next. So, did, did everyone get some that's coming around? We're opening another bottle for two. Good. Good. Oh, Liz, poor Liz. She needs it. Give her extra. Give we her have a master of wine in the room. Okay, I'm. I'm out of time, but I did. I did before I pass the poll. Um, I, I just wanted to point out. I have one more quote, please. Um, oh, sorry, I got some images. This is my favorite of all from a great champagne producer. And uh, it's sort of my life <laughs> mantra. And um, so that, that one's just for fun. One that I've developed, uh, last thing I'll say, and I think this really speaks to the heart of the conference and, and sort of why you all came here, is uh, I like to say when you entertain with champagne, connections are made. And I've found that to be very, very true, and I hope that for all of you in the cacao industry and um, that you will find some parallels, that you will enjoy champagne, and that you will bring it to the table um, throughout, your own, throughout, throughout your own work, because for some reason, um, success happens around champagne. Connections are made. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'll bring some champagne to the table as well in a minute. Um, thank you so much, Christy. That was very inspiring. Uh, now you know that you must visit uh, Napa on a Tuesday because champagne is for Tuesday. <laughs> um, with no more, let me hand in the microphone to our next speaker, Lauren Phil from Beverly Rebel, Rebel is going to talk us to a very interesting exercise. So please finish your champagne because more wine is coming. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Very good. You have champagne, so you're great. <laughs> I'm glad I got to go after you because now I'm really happy. Um, welcome, thanks to um, Carla and Jose for asking me to participate today. It's quite an honor um, and for all of you um, for coming as well. Um, so just to give you a brief kind of idea of what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to talk... Oh, can we keep the slide up now? That's fine. No? Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to give a, a brief um, uh, explanation of kind of the sector of the wine industry that I've been working in for the past decade, which is um, natural wine, um, and then we'll follow it up with a wine tasting. Um, so just to start off, uh, I've been working, as I said, for about 10 years in the natural wine world. Um, I am older than I look. I've gotten that comment several times already, so. Uh, uh, and I'm not lying. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the natural wine movement, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, represents about 1%, uh, and that's, this is an estimate, an estimated 1% of total global wine production, which is not, not much, obviously. Um, despite that, however, um, the uh, natural wine movement in context with the larger um, global wine industry is um, considered one of the most kind of hot-button subjects um, in the wine world today, um, despite its, its small size. Um, there are uh, panels like this one being held regularly, um, devoted to the merits of the natural wine movement, whether it's a trend or not. Articles are being written and everything from wine enthusiasts to um, Vogue magazine. Uh, the um, uh, natural wine bar scene, which I know I've heard of, um, <laughs> has um, really grown in a major um, metropolitan areas, New York, Paris, London, Tokyo. Um, there, there's definitely something happening um, in, in terms of uh, natural wines' contributions to the greater, greater um, wine of, world of wine. Um, and I'm going to use two words uh, today to talk about um, this sector of the industry. One is movement, which you've already heard, and the other is disruption. And I do need to apologize for the use of the word disruption because as any good TED Talk watching person knows, um, it's vastly overused. Um, uh, but uh, this is Harvard, and I didn't know how punk rock would land. So, I'm um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of, um, of background, or, or actually, maybe let's start. Who here is familiar on any level with the natural wine movement? Show of hands, great. So, like, maybe half people. Um, and then, who here feels as though they could give a, um, a strong uh, definition of what natural wine is? Anyone? Okay. If you raised your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, so natural wine, uh, for those of you who did raise your hands or didn't, um, natural wine has no formal definition. There is no certifying body um, for uh, natural wine designation. Um, nat the natural wine movement as it is now in the industry is a largely unregulated or self-regulating, depending on how you look at it um, and what your context is, um, sector of the wine industry. Um, this is both very exciting and very terrifying, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Um, but uh, natural wine is, just to, for those of you who aren't familiar or who maybe are marginally familiar, um, natural wine is, uh, in its most cerebral definition, um, a direct response to the corporate industrial wine complex. Um, and uh, natural winemakers favor uh, very small production, very limited production, very traditional techniques, um, indigenous varieties, uh, wild ferments, these kinds of things. Um, it uh, also, in its most tangible uh, definition, is primarily concerned with um, grapes that are grown either organically, biodynamically, or using another integrated viticultural practice um, without the use of um, synthetic chemicals, fertilizers, or pesticides. Uh, that's the agricultural side of things. Um, the actual winemaking side of things in the cellar, um, natural winemakers are concerned with uh, using as the least number of additives, preservatives, um, stabilizers, etc., 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 basically intervention at any point in the wine's life um, as possible. And there are varying uh, places on the spectrum where winemakers land about what's acceptable and what isn't. Temperature control is something that people argue about. Um, the use of um, sulfides, I could go on and on and on about how sulfides are the tragic scapegoat of the um, uh, industrial wine industry, um, but we don't have time. So, <laughs> another day. Uh, um, 
all of this is uh, generally to be accepted as kind of standard practice in the, in the natural eye world. If you can say that there is a standard practice, basically doing as little as possible to the wine throughout its life, whether it's in the vineyard as a grape or in the cellar or at bottling. Um, that's the goal. Uh, the reason, uh, so the, the self-regulation part also I should mention um, a lot. Sometimes the argument is that uh, the natural wine movement lacks legitimacy because there is no certifying body and there is no way to regulate um, what's being done or what isn't being done. I will say, just as an example of um, how self-regulation has worked in a uh, sector of the market that have, is currently fairly small, um, several months ago, um, a major um, food magazine published a, a paid um, content piece in which an industrial brand claimed that it was a natural wine, um, and that piece lasted, I think, uh, 24 hours before it was redacted. Um, so there is quite a strong uh, community of um, uh, in within the industry that that keeps things above board. Um, so we've gotten into kind of the foundations of the natural wine movement and kind of what it is and what it stands for and what it means and looks like. Um, to move into the side of things that's more concerned with what, again disruption. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, as I mentioned already, natural winemakers primarily work with indigenous varieties. So. Just to break that down briefly, um, most of us are probably, if, if I challenge you to name um, 10 varieties off the top, great varieties off the top of your head right now, and then I said you have 10 seconds to do it. I imagine we could all come up with Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, Merlot, Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, we, we probably, uh, under pressure, max out at about 10. Um, there are thousands and thousands of grape varieties that grow in the world, um, and there are that many grape varieties because they are all uh, genetically uh, disposed to grow in the climates to which they're native. So when you're working with native grape varieties, um, with grapes like any other crop uh, are easier to grow in the climates, uh, soil types, um, that they are meant to grow in. Um, so when you're working with native grape varieties, what you don't need to do is, it, it, to the extent that you would to need to do if you're planting more common kind of what we call international varieties, which are the ones that I just named, is you don't need to manipulate the soil, you don't need to spray chemicals and fertilizers to the degree that you necessarily need to do if you're planting something that isn't native to the climate that it's being planted in. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. Um, uh, and following, obviously, this is a more makes natural wine and some level uh, more sustainable um, practice. To, or it's more sustainable to grow, which I think following um, the UN climate report that we all, I'm sure, really with at this point, um, should be something that we're concerned about um, in the wine industry in particular, I'm sure in your industries as well. Um, so coupled with the practice of wild fermentation that I mentioned, um, spontaneous yeast fermentation at least, or cultured local fermentation, so not using any um, industrial super yeasts or anything like that. Um, and as long, along with the abandonment of finding and filtration practices, um, many of the wines produced by natural winemakers do not qualify for their local uh, regulatory appellation designations, so AOC, um, DOCG, etc. Um, so what this means, it, um, it's, a, it's a kind of multifold um, result. Um, a somewhat famous example of what I just mentioned, this uh, it involves a, a winemaker um, from the Wild Valley named Olivier Cousin, who has very famously several years ago fined $50,000 by the AOC boards for uh, kind of cheekily trying to sneak a word onto his label that the AOC boards told him he could not put on his label because his wine didn't qualify for his appellation designation. Um, he rode his draft horse up the courthouse steps for his trial. Um, so he's now sort of a, um, a popular martyr figure for the natural wine industry. But that aside, um, uh, great displays of that kind of rebellion aside, um, the fraught relationship with the um, existing Appalachian regulations um, is uh, first challenging the industry to consider what gives a wine value. So uh, do we value the zip code um, of a wine's place of origin, or do we value uh, the quality of the wine in a bottle? So uh, if a winemaker in Vouvray makes a stunning wine, but uh, she isn't allowed to put Vouvray on the label for one reason or another, either she doesn't meet the standards of the region or her wine is well fermented and maybe has flavors that are um, unusual or uncharacteristic of Vouvray, um, not necessarily flaws, but just unusual characteristics, um, should her wines be devalued in the market? So this is a question that we're starting to think about in the wine industry. Um, 
I often say that buying uh, real estate or, or a vineyard um, in a brand name Appalachian like Bordeaux or the Napa Valley um, is a bit like buying the boardwalk in Monopoly. Uh, and the market value is driven by that zip code in the same way that a uh, Louis Vuitton bag fetches a higher price than a locally crafted alternative, even though they're both made from leather. Uh, it's a similar thing in the wine industry. And so if we're talking about what Appalachian designation means and how it contributes to a wine's market value, the natural wine world and the producers who are kind of issuing those regulations and choosing to bottle um, on their own without Appalachian designation and risking that loss of market value are, are a part of this conversation in the big way. Um, natural wine is um, also uh, calling into question the value associated with established regions, um, which means that it's um, opening the doors for lesser known and historically unappreciated regions and entire countries to finally um, get their, their uh, moment, uh, have their moment. Um, so I'll give you the examples um, in the wine industry right now. So um, if you were to walk up to any sommelier or many sommeliers at this time and ask them, um, about the regions that they're most excited about um, or that they think are the, the most promising or up-and-coming regions. Um, among them would be um, Greece and Portugal. Uh, uh, El Dorado, California is seeing a lot, uh, has seen a lot of growth um, and attention in the last few years um, versus Napa. Um, regions of Chile um, that were previously unappreciated um, wines from the Republic of Georgia are among the hottest and most highly coveted wines in the wine world right now, um, as well as wines from Mexico. Um, so they're really seeing an expansion away from the kind of classic. Yes. Um, <laughs> may I suggest a career change? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really interesting and kind of fascinating time right now. We're moving away from this kind of obsession with what's the, what's the old guard um, uh, French and Italian regions, and really seeing the opportunity as these conversations about Appalachian designation and the value that's associated with them are, are kind of blown up in. It's really giving way for our uh, creating space for um, other other regions and countries of the world to, to grow. Um, and it does also extend beyond the conversation of value, which is what I just was mostly speaking about. Um, because the importance of the Appalachian uh, Association is, is um, coming into question and because uh, lesser known up and coming regions are becoming more important, uh, it's giving, uh, it's providing the opportunity for younger producers um, uh, women and those who are historically out of the uh, financial mainstream um, to participate in the wine industry in ways that they haven't been able to in the past. Um, because land in these uh, lesser known regions is less expensive, the point of entry um, for uh, young producers, again, and women um, is, is more accessible, uh, or is becoming more accessible, I should say. Um, we're also seeing um, a um, kind of boom in what are, are called kind of industrial um, wineries, or excuse me, urban, not industrial, urban wineries, um, urban cooperative wineries in particular. So you'll see a group of um, smaller producers, oftentimes a group of young producers, coming together, pulling their money to um, buy a facility or rent a facility together. Um, and share in the wine making of one wine that will fund the um, expenses for the cost of that facility, and then they'll also make their individual labels within that facility as well, um, which is something that until recently, you have, you, we had cooperative wineries, of course. Um, it was a different, kind of a different setup, um, but this, kind of, this idea of an urban cooperative winery is, is growing. Um, the natural and self Regulating kind of grassroots movement that I have mentioned already um, is uh, powering this acceptance of creativity from constraints. So although um, a lot of these ideas are new and, and not widely accepted, or uh, haven't been widely accepted in the wine industry so far, um, the kind of openness that the natural wine movement has been founded on um, is absolutely contributing to its growth. Um, it's disrupting the side of our industry that's just for generations required tremendous um, financial investment and the, all the risks that come along with that um, to participate in. Um, and I should also mention a lot of the time when I talk about these things, it, it might sound like natural wine is kind of at the fringes. Um, it, and again, it, the estimate it, that it's only representing 1% of total global wine production might suggest that as well. Um, but it's important to point out that um, Noma, so the number one ranked restaurant in the world for several years now, um, has had a fully natural wine list since its opening. 
um, as have several of the um, Pellegrino World's 50 Best Restaurants. Um, uh, the, I've yet to come across a national line that fetches the kind of price tag that, um, like, you know, higher end crew, say, for example, or these um, branded wines fetch. Uh, but they are rising to a place in the market where they are more on the level with um, traditionally um, esteemed wines. So their market value is rising. Um, and I would be remiss, of course, to give a talk anywhere about anything without mentioning millennials. <laughs> so I will. Uh, millennials um, represent a, a huge portion of the um, uh, wine consumer market, particularly in the U.S. Um, there is an, um, an independent study from the nonprofit, the Wine Market Council, that estimated that of the $62 billion worth of wine sold in the U.S. annually, uh, uh, millennials represent 42% of that. So it is absolutely um, uh, in the natural wine market's kind of favor um, that millennials also favor transparency uh, about origin and production more than any previous generation. Um, so it's only contributing to kind of the natural wine industry growth and importance within the global wine industry. Um, uh, so the as I just explained, the natural wine industry has, has really disrupted every aspect of the, of the wine industry at large um, up until this point, from um, production uh, to the economy, both at the um, consumer and market levels, um, the socioeconomic structure of the industry allowing for um, uh, uh, non-dominant populations to participate in ways that they haven't been able to before. Um, but perhaps most pertinent to this panel, um, and maybe to you, uh, are the ways in which the natural wine industry is um, changing the ways that our, our industry uh, is considering what a wine should or could be. And I say should maybe more than could because we have preconceived notions um, of what how a wine should taste, how it should smell, what it should look like, um, and the natural wine industry is kind of holding that all up to the light and saying, is this really what we want to be, um, how we want to be thinking about wine. Um, and so it's affecting our language and our context, and it's also affecting our palates. Um, so just to get into how, what that kind of looks like, um, natural wine uh, in all of its additive-free and stabilizer-free and preservative-free and powdered tannin-free and super yeast-free and frining agent-free and anti-foaming agent-free, et cetera, et cetera, um, glory, uh, it does taste different um, or can taste different, often does. Um, I would argue that it tastes better. Um, that's obviously not to me to say, um, but uh, I do find that natural wines have an expression that is more vibrant, more alive, more textured, oftentimes more complex, more indicative of the place from which it's coming from, um, and not indicative of a process that has manipulated it to taste in a way that we think that it should taste. Um, it's worth noting that the quartermaster sommeliers, who some of you may have heard in the last week, earlier this week, there was a, a bit of a scandal. Um, the quartermaster sommeliers, uh, it was discovered that there was cheating, uh, massive cheating at the, uh, the la this last year's exam. Um, the court uh, generally does not accept natural wines. Um, so the, the quartermaster sommeliers, they're considered to be kind of the, um, the gatekeepers of quality for many people in the, in the world of wine. Um, the court generally does not accept natural wines for any portion of its training or exam processes. Um, so it will be interesting to see going forward whether this chink in the MS armor um, leads to a more open um, consideration or discussion about whether natural wines deserve a seat at the table, um, which I think that they do. Uh, the, um, as it is right now, a large portion of the industry that is more is, is concerned with the um, with the flavor profile and tasting of, of wines at the master sommelier level, um, argues that natural wines are flawed, um, and they point to any number of departures from um, what's historically accepted uh, in any departure from clarity, um, acidity, aroma. Um, the most common complaints are um, excesses of volatile acidity, retanomyces, and lactobacillus, which can give off flavors in wine um, if they're not made cleanly. Um, the uh, and if those wines aren't relying on the corrective agents that are usually um, utilized by more industrial conventional producers. Um, but as natural wines are um, gaining ground, uh, these conversations about what we should be expecting and what is acceptable um, are starting to change and they're happening more often. 
uh, which means that there is more allowance for consideration about what a line, uh, a, what a line could be. That is not what we've expected it to be um, in term in context of the um, industrial line complex. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be a member of the line industry. Lots of things are changing. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, none of that matters if one isn't delicious, right? So we can get to the tasting part now. Have you all finished your champagne? I'd be really disappointed in all of you if you haven't. <laughs> Bottoms up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to guide you through um, just kind of a brief uh, tasting protocol. For all of my kind of um, departure from tradition, um, I do, um, I did, I have completed part of the um, MW certification, so I can do all of your tasting whatnot for you. We'll I'll guide you through all that. So we have um, two secret wines. So we're going to do a wine tasting. We're going to do one wine first and then the other wine second. Just make sure. Yeah, great. The purpose of a wine tasting, I'm sure most of you know, um, is to provide a sensory experience that is uh, unadulterated by our preconceptions of what um, we have in front of us, what it should be, what we expect from it. Um, it leads to a more pure experience of the wine. Or the chocolate, if that's what you're doing. So, um, the thing that everyone's always very timid about, the thing that everyone's always very timid about um, during a wine tasting uh, is the swishing around in the mouth process uh, and the spitting thing, but I don't think any of you have to spit today. If you, I wouldn't have a job if I didn't spit, so. <laughs> um, so when you do get the wine, uh, normally what we do is uh, swirl the wine around in the glass a little bit. You don't have to go nuts with it, or you can go as nuts as you like. It's entirely up to you. The world is your oyster. So the swirling uh, aerates the wine. Uh, it gives us a, a brief kind of um, expedited glimpse into the wine's expression. It opens it up for us. It makes basically what all that means is it makes the wine easier to smell and to taste. And I wasn't, I wasn't going to do this, but I think I might tell you all. Um, one of these, and I'm not going to tell you which one. One of these wines uh, is a very industrially produced wine, and one is a very naturally produced wine. And I'd like you to try to figure out which is which. And I'll reveal them at the end, so you won't be tossing and turning tonight wondering. So switch the wine around in your glass. I'll just do it with water, so I can demonstrate Okay, we're swishing, we're swishing, great. Uh, and the, the, the number one thing that everyone um, does uh, that, that hinders your ability to assess a wine or to smell a wine is that you smell the wine with your mouth closed. So don't do that. Open your mouth just a little bit while you're smelling the wine. Don't be shy about getting your nose really deep down into the glass. I often rest the top of the glass against my, the bridge of my nose so I can make sure my nose is really down in there. Don't be shy. Don't feel it on yourself, but don't <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. So we're switching the wine on. Okay. Get your nose deep down in there. With your mouth open. Most of your sensory. I'm sure you know this because you, this is what you also do. But your um receptors are also in your on your tongue. Okay. And then we're going to take a sip of the wine together. Do you need more? And I just took a sip the way everyone takes a sip. It was very polite. And this is how I actually want you to do it. Okay. Much different, right? Do you feel the wine in all the points of your palate all around your mouth? You get much more out of the wine when you swish it, and you're not polite, and you don't worry about the person who's sitting next to you and what they think of you. Okay, swish it around. Um, experience the way, not only the flavors that you're, that you're tasting, if you experience the way that the wine feels, um, both what it's doing to your um, salivary glands under your tongue and at the back of your jaw, uh, what it's doing in terms of any um, grip or like a grainy sandy thing on the tongue, that's tannin, okay? 
uh, any kind of um, uh, alcohol. Is it burning? Is it does it feel hot? Will we say hot? In the in does it feel like it's burning a little bit? Is it affecting your the retronasally? Is it getting up into your nose? Does it feel like maybe there's a lot of does it feel more like bourbon than wine? Um, Okay, so uh, does anyone want to be really brave and tell me one thing that they're smelling or tasting? Just one thing. It can be anything. There's no wrong answer. Everyone palates different. Everyone's palates different. Someone has to be brave. Alcohol. Someone had a cocktail at lunch. What did you say? Alcohol. Alcohol. What about a what about a flavor? So it feels hot to you. You mean like it? It seems like if there's a lot of alcohol in there. It smells like alcohol. It tastes like alcohol. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, what about a, a fruit or an herb or a flower or something that comes from the forest or the ground? Smoky. What else? Well, Cherry, plums, smoke. What else? Sage. 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 Okay. Licorice. Okay. Uh, almonds. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're saying a lot of different things. You're saying fruits. You're saying herbs. You're saying spices. Great. Okay. Um, I'm not going to make you venture a guess yet, a guess yet to which uh, wine this is, but, um, does so anyone, okay, well, I'll, I'm going to leave it to the end. Okay. Uh, chocolate. 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 Thank you. I'm surprised it took us so long to get to that. Okay, good. Chocolate. Good. All right. Um, so when we're assessing a wine, um, just briefly, I won't go through this with you on the second one, but when we're assessing the wine, um, what we're looking for are a couple of different things. We're looking for typicity, which means how typical is this wine um, based on where we think it's from, what it's supposed to be doing, how it's supposed to be expressing. Um, that, again, as I mentioned, the natural wine movement is kind of calling into question what we consider typicity, um, because typicity in a lot of circumstances has more to do these days with the production than the origin of the wine. So that's something that we're calling into question. We're also looking for the structure of the wine. Is it well structured? Is it well balanced? Is the alcohol, tannin, and acidity all in synchronous? Is it synchronized on your palate? Is it all in balance and in check? Um, the, the gentleman who mentioned that it smelled like and tasted like alcohol first would maybe suggest that this wine isn't fully balanced, right? We're also looking for it on a consumer level. If I were in, a, in my restaurant, in my bar, and suggesting something to a guest, I'd be concerned with how the body of the wine is it light, medium, or full body? Because guests often ask for how many people here ask for a full body red wine, and that's your go to for a lot, a lot of people. It is. Um, and the other, you know, and then we get into the nuances depending on whether you're at the consumer level or the market level, you get into the nuances of is this a good value? Um, is this a wine that I consider worth the amount of money that it's going to cost me to sell or to buy? Um, and those things, again, are based upon uh, the wine's context within the market at large, uh, how it's representative of its category, um, and also uh, if there is some, so for champagne is actually a wonderful example. Champagne starts at a, a, a premium because it is so difficult to produce, and so that's something that you take into consideration when you're considering a, a, a wine's value. Um, I think we can move on to the second one. Yeah, great. Yes, sir. I've had two glasses of wine. Um, <laughs> they have a great day. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Um, is champagne, or are there producers in champagne producing natural champagnes? There are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there are some people who argue that champagne's very complicated production method um, means that it's not, but I, I, I personally don't agree with that. But, um, Point is a very small amount. It is a very, yeah, minuscule. Again, I would say about 1%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, natural wine making, just again to keep this all, just to remind you. So the question, if you didn't hear the question, the question was whether there were um, producers in Champagne who were making natural wine. The answer is yes. And the answer is that it's a, it's a fraction of the uh, total um, production in Champagne. So for example, I go um, every year to a natural wine uh, fair. It's the largest natural wine like, gathering, a big international gathering um, in the world. And typically, um, I know almost everyone in the room. And uh, I could probably name five champagne producers that are there. So it's very small. Can we purchase in the States? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, I, maybe after if you want. I know that we're going to open up for questions um, after that. So, yeah, we can do that all over the world in one fell swoop. 
So you're all tasting experts now, right? So we're going to taste this one together as well, though, just to, just to refresh your memory. Okay. I'll wait till you all, I'll wait till you all have it. Licorice and anise. Someone said licorice last time. Licorice and anise are kind of in the same family that anise and family. Um, red, red fruits, purple fruits. Um, so I would say also just briefly something that I like to do with wine is instead of getting into the nitty gritty of these specific smells and flavors because everyone's context for flavor is different. Um, oftentimes it helps to say things like vibrant, bright, lively, um, deep, rich, ripe, round, lush, opulent, textured, um, warm. Um, uh, and these kinds of things. So that's just an aside. Um, I want to keep. I want to be um, respectful of the time. Uh, who wants to? Let's see if I raise a hand. Uh, show of hands. Who um, thinks the first one was natural? Okay. Who thinks the second one was natural? You're right. You're so good. It's so great. Um, does one person want to say why they think the second one was? Yes. Okay. And the balance is better. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so just to give you an idea, I don't have, oh, do I have one? I have one line. So the second line, the natural one, I did a really good job of putting those in there, sorry. <laughs> um, the second one was um, Anne-Sophie Dubois. Um, she's a young, very young female producer um, who actually, um, her family has owned champagne, uh, had a champagne house for generations. Thank you. She learned how to make wine um, in Burgundy, uh, and uh, this is her own estate. It's a very, very, very small estate. Um, she's in Fleury, which is one of the, it's a, it's a higher, um, crews of Beaujolais are basically um, designated zones that are considered to be higher quality production areas. Um, she is, uh, represents what a lot of people consider to be the um, growing kind of changing development of uh, Beaujolais. Beaujolais for a long time was considered to produce inferior wines. Um, that's changed a lot today uh, thanks in part to the natural wine movement and um, people in the generation previous to Anne Sophie um, whom she uh, learned an apprentice with. Um, it is large, Beaujolais wines, unfortunately, were largely thought to be inferior thanks to a man named George Duboeuf. 
who made the one that you had first. Yeah. So, uh, George the Buff, uh, so just to give you a sense, Anne Sophie's um, <coughs> dual production uh, is around 50,000 bottles a year. Um, George de Boeuf's is 30 million bottles a year. So quite a contrast. Um, George de Boeuf uh, is a very large estate. He was at first very, uh, very much responsible for Beaujolais wines gaining prominence in the wine industry, and then very much responsible for the that um, prominence tanking uh, as he as the production grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, and, grew, um, and the quality decreased. Um, he was also at the beginning of this decade. Uh, the early 2000s um, kind of embroiled in scandal for blending lesser quality grapes into his higher quality crew Appalachian wines. Um, so that's it. Uh, not, I just, yeah, I'm running out of time. Yeah. Can we hold that question to the end? Yeah. 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 So very well done. One percent of the market share has a love-hate relationship with the word disruption. <laughs> Talks about things like a UN referendum. Well done, special to chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next experience is going to be interesting because we have a lot of elements going around. So I will ask our volunteers to start running around the two types of chocolates that we have for today, so people have them at the ready in their tasting mind. And with no other introduction, thank you, of course, Laura, for that wonderful presentation. Let's go with our last speaker, Doug, the microphone is yours. So, thank you very much. I am the person holding you up from going to dinner. <laughs> so, I have 5,000 PowerPoint slides to go through. That. <laughs> so, to start off, uh, my name is Doug Miller. I teach at the Hotel School, uh, School of uh, Hospital Administration at Cornell University. Um, I teach restaurant management and I also teach uh, introductory to beer class of so beer sensory evaluation. Uh, I cannot, uh, well, I told my students because I won't be in class tomorrow because I'm with all of you, which I'm very excited about, <laughs> but I told them I had to go to Harvard to teach them how to drink beer. <laughs> now, Cornell love hate Ivy League schools, um, but I also the other thing about uh, Harvard University is one of the first major uh, projects that the university did was go to Bloom. Um, but in fact, the first president of Harvard was fired, as the story goes, because they were not supplying enough quality beer for the students here on campus. Uh, and at one point, Harvard had three breweries itself on campus. Um, all of them are long, long gone. This is 200 years ago. They all pretty much uh, disappeared. Uh, but I do see a lot of parallels between what's going on in the chocolate industry, what's going on uh, in the craft beer industry, disruption, the dirty little word. Uh, but one of the reasons why I see these parallels is, you know, if you go back 20 years ago, we weren't, we didn't really care what we were drinking in the beer sector. We just drank beer. We didn't care what type, we didn't care what it was, we just drank beer. Um, beer has a long history here in the United States and in other parts around the world. Uh, then, all of a sudden, uh, there were some individuals who decided, you know what, there's a better way. I was in Europe, trying to school the beer, uh, it's better quality. I don't want to be told what to drink, I want to drink what I want to drink. So, really started in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, you started seeing people like Ken Grossman uh, at Sierra Nevada start opening up breweries, uh, and then throughout the 80s, more and more breweries popped up, making beer that they enjoyed. The industry had a little collapse in the early 90s, um, really upticked in the last five years. Right now, there's 1.8 breweries opening up every day in the United States. We are currently at 6,600, 6,700, nobody knows for sure, because they're opening up so fast. Uh, there are 1,200 breweries who have applied for licensing in the United States, and currently 70% of the United States lives within 10 miles of brewery. Uh, 10 mile radius from where they're sitting right now, I'd venture to say there's casually five, six breweries uh, out there. Uh, most of them are small scale, most of them are uh, group pubs uh, where they're making the beer and selling it out of the own establishment. Uh, why I think there's parallels between the, the craft beer movement and the chocolate movement is we finally start saying, I don't want to drink what people give me, I want to drink something unique and different, uh, as totally see happening in the, in the chocolate world, where people are willing to pay a premium, 
uh, people are willing to hear this story and understand this story, um, and willing to try different styles opposed to being told what they are supposed to like and, and dislike. And I, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. As I tell my students in class, not every bear will try throughout the semester. We try about 60 bears throughout the semester. Uh, not every bear that they try they will like, and that's okay. Um, part of knowing what you like is trying what you don't like. And I would also say that when it comes to chocolate, you're not going to like every chocolate, and that is okay. Uh, you don't know what you like until you try something that you, that you don't like. Uh, but the important thing is exploring and expanding your horizon, your palette, what you think you like, um, and, and go through that journey, journey and growth. Uh, so when it comes to the, the other parallels I see is with a lot of the, the craft breweries opening up, they are there in front of the guests, making the beer, uh, the brewers there, or people who have an emotional uh, attachment to the product, um, engaging with the guests, that customer service piece um, is what separates. Now, with all this being said, uh, the increase of craft breweries, uh, alcohol, uh, beer consumption in the United States is flatlined the last 10 years. Uh, we are not drinking more beer. Uh, we are literally drink about the same amount of beer as we did five years ago. Um, and the big three companies control about 70% of what we drink here in the United States. Uh, one company, to be named famous, and to be uh, controls about 47% of the U.S. beer supply. Um, they control about 30% of the world's beer supply. Uh, so when you hear these stories about growth in the craft beer industry and growth in all these breweries, it's on the fringes, it's on the margins, a lot of these producers are very, very small. Um, and yes, they might post 10% you know, growth, 15% growth, but when you're that small, 10%, 50% is relative. It's, it's, it's a relative number. Um, but there has been a disruption where these large companies now are like saying, we have to change our business model because the consumer's changing, so therefore we have to change. But all of a sudden, Budweiser's now a longer beer. They're now putting that on the label. Mm -hmm. Budweiser is a brand been around for 100 plus years now, um, 125 years, and now all of a sudden they're a longer beer. 20 years ago, nobody knew what a longer beer was in the United States, as new as Budweiser, as new as beer. Um, you hear very interesting advertising that's going out there for that emotional connection. Because uh, as mentioned earlier about millennials, millennials are not brand loyal, they're not product loyal, they'll drink wine, they'll drink beer, they'll drink cocktails, they'll drink uh, naturalized, they'll drink champagne. Uh, they're, they're looking for the experience, they're looking for the story, they're looking for what's Instagrammable, and what they can post on the social media feed, which is partially, I have it, you don't, um, is what Instagram is all about. Um, but they're looking for that story and not what everybody else has, has had. And that's what's fueling part of the craft beer industry, is they're just looking for something different. Now, some people, are, we can start pouring the first beer, the stout, or the port, excuse me. Uh, and so, with that growth in the industry, the big buzz, word, press, clickbait, whatever you want to call it out there, is the sky falling. When's the ceiling going to hit? How many brewers can we sustain here in the United States? To put in a little context, we're nowhere near the amount of breweries we have per capita as we did in the 1880s, not even close. We have more breweries today, but we also have more population today. But I temper that, good chocolate word, uh, with uh, the fact that we don't drink as much beer as we did back then. Um, but yeah, there have been some spectacular failures in the beer industry. There's going to be more. Um, I say that breweries make smart people do stupid things. Um, because I, I call it the cupcake syndrome. Years ago, the cupcakes is all the rage, and everybody's opened up cup. Yeah, you make a cupcake, you open up cupcakes, store, but they don't know anything about business. Same thing is about a brewery. It's a, it's a business. You are an industrial plant. And that's why I put caution for, for people who want to get into the chocolate. Yeah, you know, it's cool, it's chocolate. Yeah, they make it. I make some pretty good chocolates at home. Yeah, it's still a business. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into running a business beyond the product itself. And that's why I think you will see more breweries close in the United States. Uh, it's natural evolution progression of any, any business. Now, the amount of closures is nowhere near on the open. So I want to say there were 60 breweries that closed last year, uh, which is a better statistic than 
the restaurant industry as a whole and the amount of closures percentage wise. The other word you hear out there is like growth is slowing down. They're not doing 16% growth. Now it's only 6%. Yeah, name an industry that can do 16% growth year in and year out. 16% is not sustainable for any industry, any business. So yeah, it is cooling down. I think it's going to cool down to about 4% growth, which is, there's a lot of industries that love 4% growth year on year out. Um, that's still very, very healthy growth. Is it the 16 though, which is not sustainable, I think it's going to cool off to 4, maybe 3%, which is more sustainable, uh, more sustainable number. Now, when it comes to beer and chocolate, uh, it's funny because it's, it's interesting because I learned a lot from all of you today. Chocolate's complicated. It's really hard. Uh, I did a similar presentation last uh, two weeks ago in Denver, Colorado at uh, the Great American Beer Festival. So the Great American Beer Festival is every year in Denver, has been for years now, since the 80s. Uh, it is a three-day event, 900 breweries, 3,000 beers. 64,000 people attend this event over three days. It's a lot of beer. Um, you get some wonky, geeky people that walk around with pretzel necklaces. Um, when they tie a string of pretzels, because if you're thirsty, you drink a little beer, you're hungry, and you're under it. Yeah, and you're hot and you're sweaty. I'm seeing beef jerky necklaces. <laughs> It's an instant crowd. But what it does is it allows the consumer to try all these breweries from around, from around the United States. You know what it is? 900 breweries. Uh, it is a football field size uh, big convention. So I did a beer and chocolate pairing there. But as soon as it was there, I was talking to the beer crowd. And they're all into the beer, what was the beer, yeah, what type of beer it was. And the chocolate was important, but not the significant factor. What's interesting is now I flipped the script where chocolate is, is the important factor. And you had the beer, you had the beer, it's kind of cool, yeah, it's kind of fun. Uh, but it's the chocolate itself. So practicing for that and this, we had a lot of beer in the house, like we always do. And we also had a lot of chocolate in the house. And my wife, uh, he's a good sport, she actually teaches wine. Uh, we had a lot of beer and chocolate over the course of the month of September, and we still have some chocolate that we need to work, work through. Uh, and I thought there's some stereotypical rules on what goes with, with beer and, and chocolate, but I was charged in, for the Denver conference is not to use porters and stouts, because that's what most people think. And I thought it was going to be easy. I'm like, oh, fruit beers, yeah, sour beers. Raspberries, raspberries, chocolate often, therefore raspberry beer would go well. No, that feels spectacular. Uh, I found out that a lot of sour beers out there just don't go with chocolate. And I was like, gee, how come? And so in the wine world, you want to have the wine as sweet or sweeter than the, the dish that you're going with, the very chocolate. The beer world is a little bit different, and that's why it still fails spectacularly. I had to go back in the drawing board, which meant I had to drink more beer and eat more chocolate. Tough research. So the typical pairing, and that's why we have the first one, and is the porter. And go ahead and try the chocolate, go ahead and try the first beer. There are no wrong answers. It's all personal preference. Uh, reason why when it comes to the beer world, um, so the porter is not sweet in the, the, the chocolate, so what's going on? So the porter itself is bitter. So what I say to people, it helps to contrast uh, the richness and the sweetness of, of the chocolate itself. Some people say they don't like porters and like stuff, but I ask them, do you like iced coffee? Yeah, I like iced coffee. I was actually talking to, to somebody uh, who's an executive at Starbucks, and he was talking about uh, shortly with millennials, 50% of the coffee that they're going to sell is going to be a nice coffee. It's a staggering number. Um, so I tell people, porters and stouts are basically like a nice coffee. We have cream and sugar, why? To get rid of the bitterness in the iced coffee, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but that's why it works with chocolate. Because how many times do we have coffee with chocolate? Common easy dessert at home, just put out some coffee and chocolate and you guys are happy. And that's why it contrasts it. Uh, you know, porters themselves, not heavy body. Uh, color has no indication of body whatsoever. Um, some people say, I don't like dark beers because they're heavy. Not necessarily the case. In fact, the second beer is lighter in color uh, than this beer and it's way heavier. Uh, it is a little bit bitter, a little bit astringent, but kind of cleanses the palate. 
Uh, the beer itself is not super cold, which is what it should be. And this beer is uh, from a brewery quarter mile down the street, uh, Cambridge Brewery, who is kind enough to, to uh, deliver the beer for us. Uh, and uh, they have it in the, in the, growler, the growler format. Um, so uh, that's why porters and stouts go well with chocolate. Uh, just side note, when it comes to growlers, because this has become very, very popular, a couple of things. Make sure you screw the cap on tightly. Uh, I had a bottle in my car and the cap wasn't screwed on tightly. Uh, I delivered to my friend about two ounces of beer. The other 63 and a half ounces was in the trunk of my car. <laughs> and uh, uh, beer and, and fibers in your trunk of your car on a warm day just don't go together. Uh, it was a new science project. Uh, so uh, once you open it, treat it like, treat it like any other perishable product. Uh, when you open it, air gets in it, which will cause it to spoil or get off flavors. And you want to drink it fairly quickly, 24 or 48 hours, once you open it sealed. It's good for a couple of days because there's a limited amount of oxygen, but you know oxygen in um, there. Um, there are different types of routers out there. There's metal, there's glass. Um, I keep one of the truck in my car often because I have so many of the glass ones that I can just give them away, so I just keep them metal oh just God. in case you pull them to the local brewery and you want to take some home with you. So I do recommend keeping a growler in the trunk of your car just in case you trip across that local brewery you want to take a little bit home with you. Uh, and it's a double walled uh, Stanley uh, growler, but I personally own there's multiple companies out there uh, that uh, it, it works well for me. Now we're going to start pulling the second beer. Uh, now, when it comes to my, my experiment, so going back to Denver, we're trying all these beers, sour beers didn't Same. work. I was really disappointed so I really like sour beers. Um, so. uh, I had to think about why it was not working. And uh, hmm. as, I, as one of the models, uh, many moons guys teach at the CI uh, campus in Hyde Park, New York, is one of our expressions was go big or go home. And what I realized is if you don't have that contrast with bitterness, then you need something really big body, which tends also to lend to sweetness. So I was started trying beers plus 9% alcohol, 9, 10, 11, 12. And in fact, uh, in Denver, uh, the last pair we had was a brewery in, in Denver called Avery, and their pumpkin beer coming in at 16% alcohol. Now, it was a pumpkin beer. It drank like eggnog. It was spiced, it was barrel aged, it was gorgeous, it was beautiful. And it did not drink like it was 16. It drank like it was 9% alcohol. Uh, because it's very, very well made. And that's where alcohol and beer can be deceptive. Uh, people think that higher alcohol, you're messing with beer. No, you're not. Sometimes it's going to sneak up on you like a sledgehammer because the beer is so well crafted that you don't receive the alcohol. I can give you beers lower in alcohol than some of the well-made high alcohol beers, and you'll get the exact opposite. So with the bigger style beers, now you're moving into barrel-aged beers, you're moving into uh, Belgian triples, Belgian duels, uh, you're moving into barley wines. Uh, barley wines, the English type of beer, has no relationship with wine whatsoever, has no grapes in it whatsoever, uh, but does have characteristics of an oxidized or fortified beer, um, starting on the 9, 10, 11, 12 percent. So that richness itself in the beer helps to stand up with the richness of the chocolate. The other nice thing I like about utilizing uh, high alcohol beers is they don't have to be as cold. So one of the things I discovered is, as advertising, uh, the mountains aren't blue, then, then don't drink it. Um, that I found out is that if you drink really cold beer and try to eat chocolate, it seizes up on it. Um, the chocolate does not want to melt on it. It makes sense. And, it, and it's kind of chunky and dysfunctional and, and brittle in your mouth and you wait for the chocolate to melt because the beer itself is so cold. You try out cold beers, you can drink them slightly like chilled almost room temperature. Um, even the first beer was not overly chilled, and that's okay. Um, so with the high alcohol beers, they don't have to be as cold, uh, which lends itself to melting with the chocolate better, so it doesn't seize up, uh, doesn't seize up in your mouth. I'm falling behind, so I have to drink. 
Because I really like this beer, and I really like uh, uh, the beer that they're making. So the last beer um, is Allagash Brewing Company, uh, Allagash up the road in Maine. Uh, they're also very gracious to give a, a case of it. Uh, so this is one of their barrel-aged beers that they do. Um, it's aged in bourbon barrels. This is the 2018 production. Um, and uh, it's very rich, it's very full, um, it is not shy, it will sneak up on you like a hammer, but it also makes a great ending to a night. Um, you can have this instead of a, a brandy or cognac uh, with chocolate at the end of the meal, um, it goes great, uh, also with a wide range of different types of desserts. The reason why I bring up the 2018 is most beer styles, particularly IPAs, 60 days for IPAs, uh, I'm that person that checks dates on bottles. I'm that person, like we go to the grocery store and you buy milk, you always look at dates and you pick the freshest one available and you leave the older, uh, the older milk for somebody else. Do the same thing with the IPAs. If you're drinking uh, New England style IPAs, which is all the range right now, really 45 days, 30 days, after 30 days, they're not as quality. Um, but a beer like this, you can put this down, you can age it for five years, six years, seven years, eight years. Uh, the oldest beer in my cellar right now is probably about 10 years old. Um, the highest alcohol beer in my cell is at 20% alcohol. Um, and I'll let that sit for a couple more years. It doesn't improve the product. Uh, it, it, it doesn't improve it. It just changes the characteristics. Um, some of these beers that are higher alcohol are like teenagers and they're kind of like rebels and they want to fight you and you let them sit for a couple years and they mellow up and they get a little bit older and they mature a little bit and a little bit calmer and more, more approachable. Um, and that's why I like this beer is great now and be fantastic in five years. Uh, and, I, and I love what they're doing. And they also have different expressions. They have one, uh, another called Jay's Bean, as in coffee bean, because it uh, has uh, coffee in it. They have another one uh, that has uh, juniper berries in it. Um, and that's a nice little uh, spice uh, flow note to the beer. Um, and they also make a wide range of everyday uh, drinking beers. Uh, the most known one the Allagash White. That's what most people know from this brewery. Uh, and that's why this beer probably go better for second chocolate, because there's some caramel in there, some richness in that chocolate. Um, and that alcohol helps to punch through that richness. Um, you can take another sip if you like. Uh, again, remember this is high alcohol. You might be sleeping very early tonight. Uh, but that's okay. That's what makes beer so much fun. And I would have to say, that's what makes so fun uh, about exploring your palate, exploring your likes and dislikes and aversions, uh, because you just don't know. And a lot of people think that uh, beer itself is like, as I was told uh, by somebody on my own campus, beer's for fat people. Why do you want to talk about beer? Uh, and my whole argument is because beer is really awesome. We've driven for thousands of years, and it's a really complex product. Um, and with the little self-discovery, people start to realize the wonderful world of beer and how complex it is. Not as complex on chocolate. And the last thing I have to say uh, about the beer world, because we were talking about, uh, we talked about, I was in the pink group, the pink group, uh, that, we, that we talked about earlier about uh, uh, disclosure. The beer world's a little bit different. The fact that all the breweries buy their raw ingredients from base and same companies. So you don't have to do disclosure on supply chain or who you're getting it from. So that everybody buys based from the same companies. Uh, they all know that everybody is paying for the raw ingredients. So you don't have to disclose that. But really is the difference in, in beer, since they're buying from all the same company and companies, is the craft and the art of and the expression of the brewery, of their artistry, of that final product. Product and what they want to, like artists do, like uh, maybe with the chocolate will be your expression of that product and what you do you want to present to the guest itself. And that's why I say that's another very, very similar uh, to chocolate peers and people in the uh, uh, chocolate industry is your own personal expression based off of what is given to you and what you want to present uh, to your clients, your guests, or your consumers themselves. So hopefully you liked everything. Everybody's still here? Yeah. This beer gets even better when it warms up a little bit. Too late? It's just one. Tasa is 10 minutes from here. Then we have Somerville chocolate. What else do we have around here? Hello? 
Oh no. <laughs> I was like, I didn't drink that much beer. <laughs> um, yeah. So Tasha is 10 minutes from here, summer with chocolates. How long? Got take on the feet. Got take on the feet. Oh, oh, this is the chocolate. LA Birdie. But well, that's like, I don't know, I don't do miles in Mexico. This so. is Harvard Square. It's in Harvard Square. It's, uh, all, it's all 10 minutes from here. It's all 10 minutes, uh, but six to, to five to six breweries every 10 months. That's something to think about in the context of not only New England, but the United States. I don't want to do my own questions. I know we have some requests for questions. Um, we have Luciana first, then I'm going to go to Chuck, and then we can take a couple of more. Uh, let me pass on the microphone. Carla, would you help me? Hi, um, I want to thank you so much about the talk on natural wine. I'm new to the concept, but uh, coming from a cacao producing region that has white cacao, okay. that relates very well with us. Uh, and for instance, we're trying to define terroir based on microflora that's found only in the region. Uh, so maybe the uh, DOC certification, it's not a way for us to move forward in our region. So it relates very well to what you're doing in wine. Uh, I'm just thinking about the shelf life of natural wine. Could you talk a little bit more on um, you know, specifics of natural wine but related to the wine that does have conservatives? Thank you. That's a really um, common question. Um, uh, so a, a wine as it is, if it's made well, um, has everything that it needs to age gracefully. So it has, uh, if we're talking about red wine, which is we're talking about, well, acidity and tannin and alcohol are all in different ways uh, preservatives and stabilizers, um, naturally occurring. Um, sulfites, uh, which are also naturally occurring, can uh, contribute to the stabilization or the shelf life of a wine. Um, but uh, the world's most age-worthy wines, if I could just name two, um, one would be Rieslings. Um, Rieslings can age very, very, very well for decades. Um, and the, the other would be, say, like Barolos, um, wines made from the Nebbiolo grape from the Piedmont region. The thing that makes both of those um, wines uh, very ageable is their very, very high acidity, naturally occurring high acidity by virtue of the um, climate and the grapes that are used in their production. Um, uh, and in Barolos' example, a uh, very strong tannic structure. Um, natural wines... Uh, is uh, if you are talking about, well, first of all, most wines that are, the majority of wines made in the world are meant for consumption within a year or two of their production. So that's that's a, the vast majority of the wines made in the world. Um, if we are talking about ageability, you would be talking about regions that have the um, climate um, and the varieties that grow in those climates where they, uh, they have the naturally occurring acidity and tannin that would suit them to ageability. Um, so I guess my short, the short answer is natural wines can age as well as any industrially produced wines. Um, the kind of obsession that we have with the aging wines is maybe not always appropriate, um, depending on what region we're talking about. Um, but yeah, natural wines can age very well. Yeah. I was going to add to that, the one interesting parallel in the beer world, there's a beer style south of Brussels, Lambic style beers, uh, Lambic style beers. Um, one that I served in class the other day, the expiration date is 2036. Um, and part of the reason why, it's wild yeast, tetamyces, lactobacillus, um, very slow fermentation, and because of its acidity and the funk that's in it, it has a very, very long shelf life uh, to it. And it can casually sit for 12, 15, 20 years. Um, question for Douglas and Lauren. Uh, so Douglas, you mentioned I think 10 years, past 10 years in the beer industry, is the, it's basically been flat growth. Yes. Yeah, correctly. So um, the craft industry though, have you seen more of that um, growing into the commodity beer industry? I guess you'd say, so what's that percentage like? 
He's maybe very nervous with ten, 10 year flat. They can't be with Kraft, I'm thinking. No, so Kraft Brain Street now accounts for about eleven percent of the about eleven percent of total beer that we consume. Um, I'm that person that we that reads uh, large companies uh, pro formas and, and stock reports. I want to say Bud as a brand is down about two and a half percent last year, uh, which is a huge number uh, considering the amount that they produce. So that's where the shift is. Um, we're shifting on what we're drinking and how we're drinking. Um, and then Laura, I'm interested in the price point difference between the two that we tasted. Uh, the price point, yeah. The, um, the so the De Boeuf would be around say retail fifteen dollars, and the Dubois would be eighteen. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Oh really? Wow. Is there any other question in the store? Wine and chocolate at tasting. I mean, you talked about natural wines, um, but it might be nice to know the pointers to follow. Do you have a recommendation format? Um, or a recommendation? Like, do we do sweet wine and sweet oh, chocolate? Sure. Or, you know, oh, yeah. So, um, as Douglas mentioned, um, the, the what you are most concerned about when you're pairing chocolate and wine, let me just move this, um, is uh, that the sweetness be matched, if not exceeded. So, the sweetness in the chocolate. Um, be matched if not exceeded by the sweetness in the wine. If you have a um, very, very, very dry wine paired with uh, chocolate, um, uh, the chocolate and the wine will both seem bitter. Um, so there is this trend um, of pairing uh, red wines with chocolate that is often very not just a terrible idea. Um, the <laughs> I'm not sure when that trend happened started, but it needs to stop. It needs to go away. Um, but it, you know, and I and I know people want to have the experience of pairing different things with chocolate than dessert wines because it seems novel and fun. But really, dessert wines are the most appropriate pairing for chocolate. Mm. Yeah. Oh, about the chocolate. Um, I mean, like part of my eighty percent. Um, does this one is being too far without any authorization? For the concern about the chocolate. Yeah, I mean about the chocolate, not not about the wine. Sorry, it's, we have the the team of Eco Exchange, and this is a uh, chocolate made in Switzerland. From but I don't I don't know the specifics of chocolate, but you can definitely ask the people from Eco Exchange. Yeah, because it's the so taste it doesn't look like being too far. No. Maybe yeah. some some adding. Some cocoa powder? Yeah, I had cocoa powder and like some cocoa powder. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I asked everyone. Oh. I, I, I asked everyone. Uh, do they have alcohol? Oh, no, alcohol. I want to say that. Well, that's because I'll do little things like that. That's why you'd all be great for the wine world and the beer world because you developed a vocabulary and a palate to discern the most minute things. So apply to one again. <laughs> Make some real money. Do you, do you want to buy me a house? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question about champagne. What's your favorite champagne? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> well, I'll, I appreciate the question, but all I can say is that's like asking a parent who their favorite child is. We all know who our favorite child is. I only have one. I only have one. Maybe <laughs> yeah, it's a better way of asking that question is your favorite Tuesday champagne? <laughs> your favorite, like, Serena Williams one normal Let's say. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate the question. Thank you so much. I, I, have, I have a sincere answer for that. I think champagne is a product that, um, and perhaps fine chocolate is like this as well. Context matters, and um, as much as I love champagne, and I, you know, my family jokes, you know, that you, that I have champagne taste on a beer budget, but that's, <laughs> but that's, um, but that's an old saying about, you know, like Budweiser, you know, Budweiser. 
Um, but, but no, sincerely, I, I, um, champagne has a huge range. Like, like chocolate, like beer, like still wines have a huge, huge range and range in price, range in styles. Um, I, I jokingly call myself a cheap champagne date because I actually prefer the young, fresh, bright, um, dry, kind of minerally styles. Uh, and 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 certainly I shop to the producers that I think work well socially, ethically, agriculturally. It's all very important to me. Um, occasionally, I find myself in the you know incredible and serendipitous situation of being with you know extraordinary champagnes, like things I could never ever afford. And I'm offered these tastes or glasses, and and as much as I can appreciate the complexity or how they are made, or if they if they have prolonged aging, which, by the way, means they're oxidized. You know, they've oxidized, right? Wine is like humans; it's oxidizing <laughs> and passing the time. And um, and also, I, you know, interestingly, I'm. I, I often joke that I'm a, you know, I'm a bit of a tree hugger. Don't cut the trees down. We don't need a lot of oak barrels in Champagne. Um, and some, some Champagnes, very few, but some, some are barrel fermented or aged in oak. N not the bubbly wine, but the still wine before it's made bubbly, just to be clear. So again, I joke that I, 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 I like the younger, fresher, brighter things for Tuesdays and most days. Um, although, uh, back to my original statement about how our palates change and progress, I, I can appreciate the more um, richer champagnes, the more vinous champagnes, the more that when they have maybe a little bit of oak inclusion. Uh, but those are not the wines I choose regularly or daily. They're, those are those are more on rare occasions. So that's a long-winded answer to a good question. I look for um, brutes or ultra brutes um, or what are called non-dosé wines, really lean, very dry, very minerally wines. I ask great um, sommeliers and and wine bar owners and shopkeepers, what are their favorite producers. I'm very, very familiar with so many brands, but I love making new discoveries and learning about new small brands that I haven't heard of before. That's why I always say, you know, please, shopping online is convenient, but unless you have a face-to-face -face eye contact, um, go to a bottle shop, ask a merchant. They, they work there because they're passionate about wine. and. They do their homework, I'd like to thank, and they can steer you in the direction of a very, very, um, you know, produ producers that make wine um, for, all the, for all the right reasons. And just quickly, last thing about that is, as I said earlier, you know, champagne is very expensive. And um, that's why I suggest buying it in bulk. Uh, <laughs> If you buy a six pack or a 12 <laughs> bottle case, it, it will serve you for sure for a year or so. Um, or my house a month. <laughs> so thanks for the question. I, I would like to add something, and specifically because I know that the members of our panels are not only sommeliers, but are also teachers and mentors. Um, in the context of chocolate, we have starting to see that there is a rising position for a chocolate professional. And seeing what happened with the Court of Masters over the years this week can only make us wonder what would happen if something such an institution existed for tasting chocolate. And what kind of professional qualities will a professional in chocolate could have, must have, in order to not only have a sensory lexicon, but to define an industry itself. So from the perspective not only from restaurant but also from school, Cornell and the CIA, what would be the profile of these professionals that get formed in an industry where there's a 1% natural wine that is growing, where there's specialty beer every, every 10 miles there's five breweries, or where there's long-standing traditions such as champagne? What would be, what would be that profile? <laughs> 
Well, I, I just have to say, well, the first thing is, is um, <coughs> not get boxed in. Um, because I try to tell people is drink what you like, regardless on who says what. And it's happened in the beer world where people are told they have to drink certain beer stuff because that's what everybody's drinking with the beer and the mustache and flannel shirts and that's cool. uh, Drink, you know, drink what you like. And if somebody else doesn't like it, who cares? It's your money. Um, so I would caution to make sure that you not end up in a situation that forces people to make certain choices based off of what they're being told, not necessarily what they would like. Um, so I would like to keep, and this is true in chocolate, is to keep it open to, yeah, there's some standards, you might like this because of X, Y, Z, but not to the point where you have to uh, eat this because I said so and I gave it 99 points out of 100. Uh, and if you look at some of those rating systems out there, they're not 100 point scales because you never see one below 70, they're really 30 point scales. So. <coughs> I would just add, um, I appreciate that, Douglas, and I appreciate the question that you say, but, you know, we kind of started with me saying how regulated champagne is, and, and, and Lauren saying how, you know, nebulous, not natural wine is, and um, just narrow, you know, narrowing down the bigger picture, you know, wine is wine, whether it has bubbles in it or not, but, um, you know, I, I do think there's a lesson to be learned from the tried and true strategies and enforced regulations of champagne, for better or for worse. I'm not agreeing with 100% of them, and I'm not a communist, but I think that there's some, there's some things that work about a, a level playing field and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and a mess and a clear message from that industry, and it's you know natural wine is working on it in, in their own in their own way. Um, you know it's a little different because there's natural wine made in many many countries, and champagne is only champagne, and, and that's what I'm speaking up from. But Jose, to your question, I, I don't have the answer, but I definitely think it's an ongoing conversation um, as it relates to to the fine chocolate world. What, what, what do you all want to see um, in terms of, of the fine, fine chocolate world? And, and I think looking at successful examples is indeed helpful. And I think I would just add, I think that's all very clear. And I think I would just add that um, it's important to remember if we're talking about creating a new organization or a new, say, certification or how, you know, organizational body, that there, it's important to keep in mind that there's, there should be room for everyone. I think when we start to really get very, 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 very strict about what we will accept and what we will not accept is when you run into situations where you're precluding people from participation that is ultimately in the long term going to ruin your industry. Um, you're stifling creativity, which in turn stifles growth again in the long term. So, and I think that's something that in the wine industry maybe we've struggled with and maybe natural wine is a response to that. Um, I don't think that natural wine is the answer to everything. This is, I don't think strict AOC regulations are the answer to everything. I think that there is a middle ground to be found. Um, and I think that if you're starting a new organization that that's the, that should be the goal. I see that time is up on us. Um, just going through a brief remarks of what we saw today in this panel, first of all, taking all of you for being here today, for sharing your knowledge. I would also like to thank the companies that make this happen. Of course, I will start with the beer, Allagash and Cambridge Brewing Company, uh, both of them New England companies that donated all of the beer. Also to the Champagne Bureau in Washington, D.C. and to Christy before that they make this donation. And of course, to Rebel Rebel, that guy promoted and uh, supplied these two wines. Not also to mention to Equal Exchange at Lake Champlain. Equal Exchange donated the Panama bars. And as a nice souvenir, you may take your Govino glass, which is actually a very interesting thing. Uh, please don't lose it. It's, uh, it works for everything, including Champagne. Um, 
And I would also like to thank our amazing group of volunteers, specifically one that has thanked me, uh, has thanked me both, two times today. It's Carla, because she gave me her trust. Yeah. And most importantly, permission <laughs> to uh, get your little tipsy in uh, <laughs> Uh, this is totally against the rules. Yeah, this is totally against the rules. In the context of hospitality, I would suggest this differently, but we are not in a restaurant, so do not dare to drive. <laughs> um, and let's just end it up simple. Uh, today you're most likely to go home and to try perhaps natural wine next time you're out. Or you're going to go to your beer shop and you're going to look for the selection that you tasted today. Or you're going to buy champagne by the bulk. <laughs> <laughs> Three are totally okay. No <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many times have you left, for example, a chocolate tasting enervised about the flavors, the story, the craftsmanship, the level of luxury, the level of vocabulary and knowledge that our experts here have today? That's the big lesson that we can copy-paste, perhaps, and apply to our own philosophy. Carla, I don't know if you have any other logistic remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you all for such a wonderful day. Uh, we have two points of business. Uh, please return your headsets as you leave. And uh, please be here tomorrow morning. We have coffee and uh, muffins again in the morning beginning at 8.30. And we will begin promptly at 9.30 in the same room that we were in this morning, the Psy Auditorium. Other than that, I wish you a wonderful evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks,